I'm Philip Chase and welcome to my YouTube channel on the best of fantasy. Today's video will be on one of the big ones, none other than Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series, which is 14 big volumes long, beginning with The Eye of the World and ending with A Memory of Light. Credit also should be given to Brandon Sanderson, who finished the series by writing the last three books, which were originally supposed to be one book. And he did a very, very wonderful job of that. So, you know, considering all 14 volumes together, it is certainly one of the greatest achievements in fantasy and in literature, I would say. I'd like to begin by talking about something that I consider to be one of the greatest strengths, but also a small point of criticism, and that is the prose of the series. Now, as I was reviewing some of the books just uh, for the sake of researching for the, this video, I was really struck by the beauty of a lot of the prose. Uh, Jordan's prose is actually very poetic, and there are a lot of really lyrical, beautiful passages. In fact, you know, in, in throughout the series, the, the sword forms have various names, and these names almost sound like haiku. And the prose is also very descriptive. In fact, I would say that uh, in the first book particularly, Jordan really uh, deliberately evokes Tolkien. And uh, this is not some slavish imitation of Tolkien, as you sometimes would see from, from fantasy in the, the 70s and 80s. Um, it's really more of a tip of the hat, I would say. The somewhat rustic main characters begin in the bucolic setting of Emmons Field, which is invaded by Trollocs, which are fairly reminiscent of orcs, and they are led by these uh, mirrored drawl, which are a riff on Nazgul. Also, there is a sort of nebulous, dark power uh, that is the main antagonist of the story, uh, Shaitan, or the Dark One, who is really a Sauron, Satan type of figure that looms uh, in the background through most of the series. Importantly, uh, the Dark One has tainted magic, um, especially for men, or in particularly for men, and uh, he acts through his Chosen Ones, or the Forsaken, as everyone else calls them. But by the, uh, by the end of the first book, uh, the series begins to take on a very different feel from Tolkien, uh, from Lord of the Rings, and uh, particularly in the sense that in Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo is charged with destroying power, whereas in A Wheel of Time, you have characters who are becoming more and more and more powerful and are having to learn how to deal with it. Now, uh, back to the prose for a moment. Um, so... I'm a big fan of description of certain things like landscapes. I love a really beautiful landscape. So I'm not at all opposed to description in fantasy, especially as I recognize it's a big part of world building. However, Jordan spends uh, an unusual amount of time describing clothes. And maybe uh, it's just my own personal taste. Uh, I'm probably not uh, the most fashion conscious person there is. Uh, so that might be part of it, but I, I just feel like he spends an awful lot of time talking about clothes, uh, whether it's the, the lace on the, the cuff of somebody's jacket or the sheen of the, of the button or, oh, and there are, uh, of course, dozens of different nations with all with different fashions, and these are all described in great detail. So in general, I would say my little criticism here is that, uh, the books would have benefited from some editing because a lot of times this description really does slow down the pace. Some people describe a, a slowdown or a slump in the middle books. This is not something I personally experienced so much as um, a perception that the, the books would benefit from some trimming throughout. Although I will say that most of the books end on a climactic gallop in the last you know 100 or 200 pages. This criticism is less true of the final three volumes, which were written by Brandon Sanderson, um, and maybe that's a stylistic difference. Uh, also, I think it could be because Sanderson benefited from telling the end of the story, when the climax is happening. So uh, the pace is a bit faster, really, I would say, in the, in the final three books than in the rest of the series. Now, on to another, I think, great strength of these books, which would be the characters. Uh, so there are some really wonderful, powerful, uh, really well-realized female characters in the series uh, who play a big role. 
And some of my favorites personally are Nynaeve and Avienda and Min. Um, but it must be said that the, the main show really is these three male characters, uh, Matt and Perrin, who are very well realized, interesting characters. Matt especially does provide the occasional uh, comic relief. Um, but the main protagonist of uh, the biggest character of all, the main concern of the series is without a doubt Rand. So one thing that Jordan does really well in regard to character is that he builds conflict in them, most especially in the main characters and most of all in Rand. Um, and this is a result of the increasing amounts of power that he experiences in the book. It also has a lot to do with how he is used because of his power. A lot of the other characters uh, want to use him. And um, the, the main characters really do develop nicely over the course of the series. They make some uh, really tragic mistakes along the way and um, sometimes agonizing uh, and even deadly. And uh, the, what you really see is the, the more power there is, the greater the stakes become and uh, the greater potential for destruction. Jordan leans pretty heavily on the chosen one trope, which is of course very well worn in, in fantasy. Um, and there are prophecies and various titles that he uh, gains and um, he becomes almost ridiculously powerful. But I think Jordan saves the character uh, by making Rand also very vulnerable due to the nature of his power and the insanity that it brings in him. Rand is uh, quite literally uh, conflicted and it has a lot to do with what's going on in his mind and I don't want to say too much about that because I want to keep this uh, spoiler free. But it's a very interesting aspect of his character development and I think it's very well done. In fact, one of my uh, favorite iconic moments, and there are many of these by the way, but one of my favorite iconic moments in The Gathering Storm, um, I think that's the uh, 12th book, um, is when uh, Rand goes to the top of the Dragon Mount and he, well, I can't really say what he's gonna do because no spoilers. Um, and if anyone who has read the book probably knows what, what I'm talking about, and if you haven't read it yet, uh, well, you'll see. There also are some very interesting villains among the Forsaken. In particular, uh, I enjoyed Ishmael or Moradin, um, who is kind of one of the main antagonists. Um, and his relationship with Rand actually becomes kind of interesting. Um, and he is a, a, in himself a very interesting character uh, due to the fact that he's not so much hungry for power as for annihilation of life and particularly his own. And he's also a very philosophical villain, um, unstable and unpredictable and kind of brilliant. So the one weakness that I, I perceive, at least um, in character development, would be the romantic relationships. I kind of wish Jordan had spent a lot less time de uh, describing clothes and more time building up to the romantic relationships, which feel abrupt to me and um, a, a bit hard to swallow, as if they kind of come from nowhere at times. But there can be no doubt whatsoever about the astounding uh, vastness of the world building here. Um, and it's really, uh, I would say, one of the biggest selling points of the books, or depending on your perspective, perhaps one of the biggest difficulties. It's not really that the a Wheel of Time is complex so much that it's just vast. One of the things that I really love is uh, the connection to the past. This is something that's really well done. So it's a common trope in fantasy to have some past age where uh, things were much more sophisticated, there was better technology, um, et cetera, et cetera, and some great cataclysmic event ended that civilization, resulting in a less sophisticated uh, civilization or culture in the present. So this is definitely there in A Wheel of Time. What's interesting though is that uh, Jordan builds a, a literal connection to the past uh, through reincarnation. There's also the overarching idea of the wheel of time and the cyclical nature of life. And I don't wanna to say too much about that because again, we're keeping this spoiler free. But my main take here is that the books are actually quite accessible. You do need to be persistent, um, but if you enjoy them, that's really not a problem. Now, just a little bit about the magic system, which is not uh, that complicated, but it is an important part of the plot, and I would say very well done. 
Um, so you have a kind of dualistic magical system in the sense that there is a uh, one power and people channel this one power um, by weaving a combination of five elements. And the one power has two parts. There's uh, Sidar for women and Sidin for men. And, and of course, Sidin is the one that's been uh, tainted by the Dark One, resulting in the insanity of any men who channel. That uh, taintedness of Sidin is a major plot point as well. Um, and of course, this means that the, the people who really have the power, especially in the beginning, are the women, the Ace Sedai, um, who are, for the most part, um, they're uh, based in the White Tower. Um, this is a very strong institution, kind of almost religion, um, with a great deal of influence over society. And these women are, are very long-lived and, and very powerful. Ultimately, I would say that uh, Wheel of Time has a, a philosophical or even theological heart to it. It's a reminiscent at times, uh, at least, of Eastern religions um, with its reincarnation and the repetition of ages, as, such as you see in Hinduism and in Buddhism. Um, but it also uh, has the dualism that you find in um, Zoroastrianism or in the um, monotheistic religions. It is a classic tale of good and evil, but the good characters are far from land. They stumble, they fail, they make tragic mistakes, and uh, in spite of their enormous power, those mistakes and their humanity make them actually quite relatable. So for these and uh, other reasons, I would certainly rate uh, Wheel of Time as among the best of fantasy, one of the greatest achievements, as I said at the beginning of the video, um, actually really quite astounding in its breadth and depth. In my future videos, I'll be discussing more of what I feel makes fantasy great. So I hope you will join me. And if you, if you like this content and you're interested in fantasy, particularly the best fantasy, I encourage you to like and subscribe. And I do hope to see you again. Until next time.